Hello, my name is Richard Singh, and I'm very pleased to be able to tell you that my book, Operation Idris, has now been published in a second edition by my colleagues at the Society for Libyan Studies. This edition gives clearer emphasis to its overriding historical theme, which is the difficult and contentious process by which Mohammed Idris al Sanusi came to be installed, first as Amir of Cyrenaica in 1947, and then eventually as King of all Libya in 1951. The book had its origins in the closely written diary kept by my father Peter Singh, who recorded daily life in wartime Cyrenaica between 1943 and 1945, and later added a memoir covering the following years. Together, these cover, in considerable detail, five years spent as a member of the British military administration based in Benghazi. This replaced the administrations in place under Italian colonization and Nazi German military occupation. The diary provides a unique record of day-to-day -day events, as well as comments on the work and behavior of himself and his colleagues during a tense and difficult period. It was a time of great uncertainty, not least because those in charge were operating under the assumption that Mohammed Idris would lend legitimacy to their presence by choosing to return to the land of his birth, which he had abandoned in 1922 in protest against Italian rule. Because Idris made only the briefest of visits during those same five years, before he did eventually return in 1947, I focused my additional researches in the official archives and elsewhere on the nature of Britain's complicated relationship with Idris, both before and after his return from exile in Cairo. Cyrenaica, known in Arabic as Barca, refers to the eastern region of Libya, bordering Egypt, Sudan and Chad, and it is in many ways distinct from Libya's two other large main regions of Tripolitania and the Fezzan to the west. In the war years of the early 1940s, British strategic planners mostly saw Cyrenaica as a useful base for army, navy and air force operations. One described it as a western bastion of the Middle East. And it was also seen as a potential emirate similar to Jordan. And so the key political objective at the time was to cultivate and foster the support of its long-term emir in exile. The British administration in Cyrenaica after 1942 depended on a few dozen Arabic-speaking British officials, most of them on loan from Sudan, but also drawn from Egypt, Palestine and Iraq. Among them were Duncan Cumming, a former provincial governor in Sudan, the diplomat Hugh Foote, the anthropologist Edward Evans Pritchard, and the Islamic law expert Norman Anderson. The British officers and officials were at first welcomed as liberators, which made their task seem relatively easy. They were also perhaps lulled into thinking their familiarity with Sudan and elsewhere gave them a special understanding of the people. The model applied in Cyrenaica had been borrowed from the elite Sudan political service, which operated on a principle of indirect rule seeking to enhance the political status and power of certain pre-existing ruling elites. Mohamed Idris made his first brief visit to Cyrenaica in July and August 1944, and it was an occasion in which Peter Singh was closely involved at one stage, and so wrote his own intriguing record. At the same time, the British authorities saw the visit as highly significant 
as is evident in the way that this October 1944 article in the London Picture Post was presented. However, Idris was not always amenable to Britain's strategic aims, and he was very skilled at exerting pressure. He stayed only a few weeks and then returned to Egypt, where he would remain until he could negotiate better terms. Even after the war ended, he continued to be an elusive and frustrating partner in the enactment of Britain's strategic ambitions. Until the Allied powers could agree on the future status of the whole of Libya, Cyrenaica remained in diplomatic limbo. On the ground, the reality was of continued military occupation, but this increasingly exposed the administration to the risk of political hostility. Although Britain was at this time dismantling its empire, uh, starting with India, it is interesting to note how it was also prepared to spend diplomatic effort and significant financial resources to keep Cyrenaica within the British sphere of influence. The archives show that by 1946, the most relevant negotiations were those held in secret in Cairo between Idris and the man who had first headed the administration in Cyrenaica, Duncan Cumming. While Idris was pushing hard to install his own government, Cumming was telling his superiors, we will continue to press for a settlement leading to the independence of Cyrenaica, provided Idris will promise us the military facilities we require. The negotiations reached a new pitch in early 1947 over the award to Idris of a knighthood of the British Empire in official recognition of his loyalty during the war. Before the ceremony was due to take place in Benghazi, Idris literally refused to board the train out of Cairo until he received £2,000 in cash, a substantial amount of money at the time, perhaps 100000 in current values. Cumming handed over the money and the ceremony went ahead in January 1947. The British had hoped that Idris, who was from this point onwards officially referred to as the Amir, would remain in Benghazi after the investiture, but once again he returned to Cairo and refused to take up residence until his demands were met for a civilian government with him, with him at the head and for Britain to provide his official residences, his vehicles, and pay all his official expenses. The last months of 1947 were a turning point, as Idris got everything he demanded, including a purge of certain British officials, including Peter Singh, who had expressed unease about the terms of the new order. The deal with Idris effect effectively installed him as an autocratic ruler without credible democratic checks and balances. But the issue that did most to split opinion among the British in Cyrenaica was the distribution of the best farmland to Idris's closest relations, none of whom had had, had any experience of or interest in farming. Idris may have been a gentle, indeed a very spiritual man with great virtues, but his 100 or so cousins were another matter, and in the years that followed, their political and economic dominance would eventually serve to undermine Idris's own popularity and appeal. When Idris finally arrived to take up permanent residence in November 1947, the palace originally built for an infamous Italian governor, Rodolfo Graziani, was refurbished to accommodate the Amir and his household, and another four or five large houses across the province were made over for his private use. On the 1st of June 1949, Idris went on to make a unilateral proclamation of independence for Cyrenaica alone. 
the British press, without exception, reported entirely favourably on the on the move, and Idris paid his only official visit to Britain. After his return, he took over the reins of power in coordination with the chief administrator, who now became known as the British resident. This was more than halfway to complete independence for Cyrenaica. This tight and exclusive British Cyrenaican relationship lasted only two years and came to an end because the fledgling United Nations saw the wider Libyan arena as a test bed for its own authority. A United Nations commissioner, the Dutch diplomat Adrian Pelt, was appointed by the General Assembly in December 1949 with the ambitious goal of achieving full independence for the whole of Libya by December 1951. Britain was already close to recognising Cyrenaica's independence in return for a treaty providing military facilities for the foreseeable future. But as soon as Pelt heard of this, he realised that such a treaty would have planted a bomb under the United Nations plan for Libya by provoking outrage in the rest of the country. Ultimately, and fortuitously for the, for the United Nations, the prospect of a federal but united and independent Libya under the leadership of Idris proved to be the solution most favoured in all parts of the country. And this was seized upon as a convenient closure to the whole episode. There remained the matter of holding elections to bestow legitimacy on the new king, and as my book recounts, Peter Singh's immediate successor as political secretary in Cyrenaica, Jeff Castles, was required to use loopholes in the electoral law to the advantage of Idris and those politicians who supported him. Castles later put forward a defence of his role in those elections and noted that the entire Libyan political setup was a very flimsy structure and that it had been stitched together very rapidly by UN diplomacy and it risked collapse. But he argued it had seemed better to give it a veneer of success even when its weaknesses were so apparent. This is worth remembering when considering how and why Libya has so easily become unstitched in its more recent upheavals since the removal of Colonel Muammar Gaddafi in 2011. As I point out in the epilogue of my book, while Libya's achievement of independence in 1951 was both historic and highly significant for the rest of Africa, Many of Libya's unresolved political issues were easily ignored at the time, only to re-emerge under succeeding generations. The whole country's difficult and dangerous lack of national cohesion has been all too evident ever since Gaddafi's overthrow. The British administration of the 1940s obviously helped lay the basis for Libyan independence, but it would also appear to have lacked democratic accountability and to have reinforced the country's inherent regional differences. Nevertheless, we can learn from this that Libya's problems of national cohesion do have a tendency to pose ongoing challenges to the international community. This is apparently as true now as it was over 70 years ago.